Hi, this is Heidi Burgess, and I want to continue my discussion of our colleagues who have laid the path for work on systems and complexity approaches to peace building. Today I want to talk about Rob Lasigliano and his book, Making Peace Last. The premise of this book is that, well, peacemaking itself is very difficult. Even more difficult is making peace agreements last. 25% of wars are ended that end by negotiated settlement revert to war within five years. The purpose of the book is to try to help people understand how to prevent that problem. He starts by asking, why isn't peace building sustainable? And he has a number of factors that he thinks answer that question. Number one, we tend to approach peace building linearly. In other words, thinking in terms of cause and effect. That's too simple. In addition, our interventions are micro. They work around a table. They just involve 10 or 20 people. But that doesn't add up to macro, meaning society-wide, billions of people impact what he calls peace writ large. In order to do better, we need a holistic approach to peace building, which helps bridge the gap between micro, macro interventions and macro effects. What does he mean by holistic thinking and a holistic approach? Well, several things. It's important to see the whole system, not just parts of the system. To see interconnections between the different elements in the system. And to look at causality as a dynamic factor, not a linear one. So just because one element influences another element in a particular way does not mean it's always going to have that effect. Other factors may become more important. Uh, initial factors may completely disappear. You have to look at the patterns of change over time. And the easiest way to do this, he thinks, is by drawing a system of conflict maps similar to what was done in Peter Coleman's book, The 5%. In many of our classes, Guy and I also have students draw conflict maps. And this slide shows two of them. And what you can see here is that each one of these uh, pictures has a number of elements with causal arrows, arrows in it. And these are just one of a number of slides in each of these maps that are put together to show a complex system of interrelationships. Rossigliano also talks about what he calls the SAT model, where S stands for structural elements, A attitudinal elements, and T transactional elements. And these are the things that he suggests should be put on a map because these are the things that try to drive intractable conflicts. Structural elements are systems and institutions that are put in place to ba meet basic uh, human needs. They include governance structures, uh, organizational structures, business structures, social structures, the way that people are linked together uh, according to rules and laws and policies that determine in part what they do and what can be done. Attitudes are norms, beliefs, values, relationships, cooperation, I should also have competition in here, uh, that also influence the way people interact and they influence the way we interpret the world around us and the conflict itself. And lastly, transactional elements are conflict resolution, collaboration, relationship building processes and skills that allow people to interact with each other, with their attitudes, with the structures, in order to make the system 
change. All of these things interact with each other. So even here is some complexity in a very simple conflict map because there are interactions between all the structural elements, all the attitudinal elements, and all the transactional elements. But when I ask my students to draw conflict maps, one of the rules is that you don't want to put in double-headed arrows because that hides feedback loops. Let me show you some more complex conflict maps. Here's one that was put together by a student of ours named Ryan Bullock on Afghanistan that uh, shows the structures of the Afghanistan conflict a number of years ago. And I should mention that uh, Rosigliano tells folks to what he calls listen to, or I say study the system and the system map in order to understand what's going on and how best to intervene. So in this structural map, uh, you can see lots of structures, which are the blue boxes, uh, which may or may not be too small for you to read, but they include factors involving rule of law and corrupt governance structures and inadequate social services which are all structural elements that Ryan saw as driving the conflict in Afghanistan. He had a separate map for attitudes. The attitudes are uh, the pink items, and they include uncertainty, uh, fear, poverty. He puts corruption in there, too. It was part of the structure, and it's also part of attitudes extremism, religion, shared history, ethnocentrism, um, the notion of one group's Pashtun superiority other over the other groups are attitudes that are driving this conflict. And lastly, there are transactions. And I will note that uh, Ryan does have double-headed arrows in here, which if I were grading him now, I'd tell him, Ryan, change that. Um, and I didn't notice that when I posted this. The problem with double-headed arrows is that they obscure feedback loops. But if you look at an uh, arrow, for instance, the arrow that's going from, uh, let's say, a weak central government to a struggling economy, they interact and they influence each other. The weak central government is causing the economy to struggle and the economy struggling weakens the central government. So that's actually a loop. So all of these double-headed arrows are actually what Peter Coleman and Rob and I would focus on uh, as feedback loops, which is the fundamental element of a conflict map and a complex conflict structure that is different from a basic linear uh, causal structure. The conflict, lo the feedback loops are very important. Rob suggests that you stop thinking about solutions, which is a linear approach to problems, and rather talk about the planning, acting, learning model, where you study the conflict structure and attitudes and transactions, the, the map, you plan an intervention that you think will work effectively based on, he doesn't say this, but I will, Peter Coleman's notion of energy centers and actionable hubs. You act in order to influence the system. You monitor what happens. You learn from that monitoring. And then you plan a response. And it's a continuous cycle. What that means is that you replace linear thinking with systemic thinking. And you create networks of effective action. Now, going back to the SAT model, you can look at the structural elements on a map and if, for instance, you looked at that map on Afghanistan, which said that there was a lot of corruption in governance, then you need governance reform. 
And it said the economy was weak, so you need economic reconstruction. There was weak or non-existence rule of law, so you need to establish rule of law. And you certainly need an Afghanistan security sector reform, because the security sector really isn't operating effectively at all. In terms of attitudes, you can use truth and reconciliation commissions to try to get beyond the atrocities of the past. Afghanistan isn't there yet because the atrocities aren't in the past. Trauma healing, you might be able to do some of that for people who have experienced traumas in the past, although clear the, clearly the trauma is still going on. Dialogues and what he refers to as peace camps to try to get people to develop more peaceful, tolerant, uh, conflict resolution consistent attitudes. And lastly, the transactional elements that are important have been used to some extent, need to be used more, include such things as mediation, ceasefires, negotiation, and confidence building measures. And all of these interact with each other. So the attitudinal uh, interventions will influence the structural interventions, will influence the transactional interventions, which will influence the transactions themselves and the structures themselves and the attitudes themselves. And so the map is continuously changing, which is why you need to have the planning uh, action learning cycle continuously throughout the intervention process. So here's a final summing up of the implications of the SAT model and the PAL model for current peace building practice. First of all, let's compare current linear assumption assumptions about the way to do peace building with systems-based assumptions. With current linear assumptions, your goal is to find solutions to problems. With systems, you're trying to nurture change from within the system. Why? Well, because systems aren't problems to be fixed. Rather, the, uh, I don't remember now what SPA stands for, um, the systemic um, planning assessment, I think, is a way to listen to the system and watch what happens as it develops and changes. The means to your goals in uh, traditional linear peace building is to predict and control change. In complex systems, you really cannot effectively predict what's going to happen. Rather, you need to listen to the system, or here is what SPA stands for, do a systemic peace building assessment. Because no one controls the system but you can use a PAL cycle to foster learning. Current linear approaches to peace building create preset and static benchmarks. And if you don't meet those benchmarks, you're considered to have failed and you probably will not get funding renewed. A systems approach fosters learning through flexible, adaptable actions and best benchmarks. You realize that change is unpredictable and in order to maximize change for the better, you want to create both vertical and horizontal integrated networks, a lot like going back to John Paul Lederach's uh, horizontal and vertical relationships in his peace building pyramid uh, in order to maximize the possibilities for effective action. And lastly, current linear assumptions is people expect small projects, micro interventions, to add up, if you do lots of them, to big change. But Rob arg argues that this just doesn't happen. The only way it will happen is if you create this vertical and horizontal integration and you make small changes, which he says, interact out throughout the system. If you're interested in learning more uh, about uh, Rob's model, I sincerely uh, urge you to get his book, uh, Making Peace Last, and details about uh, it are found in the transcript 
uh, of this video on the Beyond Intractability and Moose websites. Thanks.